Now we would like to begin the final crosstalk and closing session for the Innovative City Forum. The moderators who have overseen the three-day event, the program uh, committee members uh, will take the stage, Mr. Hazel Takenaka. Mr. Hiro Ichikawa. And Mr. Fumio Nancho. And Mr. Joichi Ito. Now then, I'd like to hand over the microphone to you, Mr. Takenaka. Thank you. My name is Hezo Takenaka. The Innovative City Forum has uh, finally entered its final closing session. And I'd like to thank all of the speakers, as well as the staff, as well as all of you in the audience who have built up the momentum for this uh, symposium. And I would like to make this a very good closing uh, for the event. How will we be living in 20 years? We have been uh, talking amongst various stakeholders about the lifestyle and future of cities. That was the objective of this forum. And now we have with us the moderators of each of the sessions on the stage, plus members of the program committees who developed the program. And we also have in the audience all of the speakers uh, who spoke today and the people in the general audience. So I'd like to make this as interactive as possible. So first of all, through the various sessions, what kind of discussions were actually held? And as moderators, how each one of you actually received or understood the content. Uh, so I'd like to each ask each one of the uh, moderators, <laughs> don't look so puzzled. I mean, we talked about this during the <laughs> um, briefing session. Uh, so first of all, uh, Mr. Nanjo, who oversaw all of the art-related sessions, if you could wrap up in about 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Rather than summary, I would like to share with you some of my impressions. So on the whole, First of all, everything seems to be v becoming more and more interesting. That is because in the discussion, what we have uh, never heard in the past, new perspectives, new ideas, new case studies, many of these things were included and incorporated into their presentations. So all the sessions were quite substantive, very useful, and very persuasive. I believe that uh, is my first uh, impression. And on the 8th, the very first day, we had the special session co-organized by the Japan Foundation Asia Center, and almost all the speakers were from Asia. So the content of the presentations were more oriented to Asia. Asian cities, Asian art, Asian people were at the forefront. So I was able to feel very keenly what is happening in the cities of Asia today. In Asian cities, different from the past, uh, if I may say so, there are dramatic changes happening. And uh, they are not uh, so uh, far behind uh, the cities in to Tokyo. New technology, new culture, new art are pervading all the cities in Asia. Now, on the other hand, for art, we were focusing a lot on media art, and there were many experts and artists in the world of media art. So I believe we were able to understand on first-hand basis what is happening in the world of media art. And especially towards the end, what Mr. Gunaran has shown us, within the city, there is something like we are able to go into the real city, real world, through a game. So if you have small gadgets and you go into the cities and you encounter people, you're able to play game with the others, or you hide yourself, have a hide-and-seek game, 
then something invisible layers are in the cities and using that as a platform, something happens. That is the world in which we live in today. And art in general sense, art for the purpose of seeing and participating and experiencing. And these things are also spreading all over the city. And we are able to spread uh, such an art through technology all over the city. And uh, as Dr. Mr. Carlston Nikolai has shown us, his installation in Hong Kong, uh, the tallest building in Hong Kong, uh, if you put your app of your mobile and lock in, then the sound will be created. And who are the audience? Who are the spectators? They are all over the city. So from everywhere in the city, you can appreciate uh, the art. And also, Mr. Saito from Rhizomatics have shown us in the AU commercial, these are the things that are now realizable, achievable through art and technology. And some of them are already available. Such technology, cutting aid technology, and also an art product. I don't think you see any boundaries. I don't think you can any more draw lines between art and technology or, or art and media or whatever. So there are limitless possibilities for art. And Joey has discussed uh, a lot about biotechnology. To say something uh, superfluously, uh, several years ago, I had the exhibition of art and medicine at the Mori uh, Art Museum. From Ronald, even Ronaldo da Vinci uh, was mentioned, but also uh, there is an art created with biology, also exhibited there, with uh, uh, the genetics. And if you would inject. The, the gene of a squid into a rabbit, then the rabbit will light up, by it will cut up, and that was also introduced. And the Symbiotica from Austria had a small cell, a skin cell, is being grown in a uh, the uh, uh, the vial, and it was a. Fur coat. Is it art? But this has been proposed as an art. And what is interesting about this is taken from a human skin, you can have a leather coat. You don't have to kill an animal. You can grow a fur jacket or leather jacket. You don't have to kill the animals. So then perhaps we can enjoy beefsteak without killing the cow, perhaps, in the future. And such a technology would mean uh, you can create an organ, a human organ, from your own cell eventually. When you get sick, what to do with medicine? If you have uh, the cancer of the pancreas, what would you do? Or you can just, uh, uh, the, through surgery, take the pancreas out, and you would recreate your pancreas using your own cell. Then, if you get sicker with the other organs, then you can transplant or replace everything, then what are you? Everything is being replaced. Are you the same human being? Are you your own self anymore? That would be the question eventually. Then what is the identity of yourself? That would be the big question. This is a philosophical, philosophical question. So using information technology is being so developed and medicine has so well developed. But on the other hand, what information technology has created, rather than problems, the problems to do with biotechnology may be even greater to do with ethics and also with the philosophical questions. So in that sense, we are at a critical juncture right now. And the rules and regulations to control these things have not yet caught up with the reality. The reality is far ahead of the legislations. The technology is already available, but nobody has yet established good rules, solid rules, 
for them. We are living in such a world, then art may be quite interesting and exciting. So ultimately, using biotechnology, perhaps uh, an animal, a creature who have never ever been seen by anybody can be created, then art will be God. That could be a possibility in the future. Now, I have been discussing with uh, Joy about biotechnology in many sense, so I have uh, heard with great interest uh, Joy's session and also uh, Mr. Ichikawa's session as well. The question to do with city may now go into the realm of uh, a biosphere, the biological of the world. As Joy has said, uh, city is not just hardware. There are invisible layers on top of the visible hardware. And the invisible layers are being uh, supported by uh, the mobility, uh, the energy, and else, the else, something quite new. The mobility may be made possible through completely innovative means in the future. So everything is supported by technology. And if I may discuss about Olympic and Paralympic Games in 2020, uh, art would be relevant in that sense as well, as I have listened and I've seen with my own eyes today and also on 8th, on the 8th, the first day, what is happening in Asia. So how to relate with city and trying to involve and engage uh, these spectators, the citizens as participants, not just on a one-sided, unilateral, one-way, an expression of art, but it would be more two-way, interactive, now, lastly, on creativity. In every sense, creativity is something of a must, something essential. Joy has raised many questions, and what is important? Which is important, art, creativity, or science? And I believe, believe the audience have voted for creativity. But I couldn't understand the intent of the question. Art and science, the very essence is creativity because creativity is already included in art and science. That is my view. So when we try to engage in art, already it is not just paintings and sculptures. This is what you need to understand. Of course, sculpture is an art. I wouldn't deny that. But then you have new things being added. And now the world of art, domain of art is so vast and so broad and artists will go into the new realm. And looking at the, the such a wide expanse of art, uh, the spectators should enjoy, the audience should enjoy. Thank you very much. Uh, there was a lot of depth and uh, breadth uh, uh, to uh, what has been discussed. And thank you for summing it up in such a nice way. I'd like to ask the following to Mr. Nanjo. Um, Mr. Nanjo uh, did a questionnaire survey, and uh, one of the questions uh, was uh, the following, and uh, there were these answers. Uh, could you put that up on the screen? Is it unavoidable to demolish uh, the old city in order to create uh, a better city? And to that, 75.6% said no. And uh, those who are seeking something new, and this is the tone of this conference, on the other hand, um, people have a sense of security in uh, old things. Uh, they feel comfortable with old things. Art and the city are different, uh, but uh, uh, this is a questionnaire survey uh, uh, which you did, Mr. Nanjo. How do, did you interpret that? I was surprised. Uh, we were talking about moving ahead, uh, advancing, but on this question, uh, in a very strong way, uh, people are uh, showing an attachment toward the old. Uh, there are towns uh, with value that should be kept, and then there are cities that are not so valuable that perhaps uh, need not be preserved. Part of Tokyo uh, was such that uh, after the war there were barracks. Uh, uh, the, uh, Tokyo was totally uh, burnt down, and uh, there were shacks uh, which were built after that. 
do we have to retain that? Um, there's, that's a question. And for security, can we leave things uh, as is? Uh, there are such uh, cities. So uh, when we uh, take this into consideration, I believe uh, this uh, answer uh, would there would be more of a bipolarization with regard to this answer. But in general, uh, there's attachment toward the old, which is strong. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's uh, difficult uh, to do new things. The difficulty is shown. But creative uh, destruction, that has to be there for innovation to take place. Uh, uh, Schumpeter said uh, that. He coined the term uh, creative uh, destruction. Maybe uh, we're talking about this. Uh, centered around the technology, uh, we had a lot of discussions, and uh, Mr. Ito led that. Uh, Mr. Nanja talked about uh, creativity as a key word. And so on this uh, point, I'd like to... Uh, uh, and he wanted to hear from you about this. Uh, so bearing this in mind, uh, could you talk about the session that you chaired uh, on uh, the uh, summary of the session? And I would include uh, my keynote speech uh, in my summary. What I wanted to say, what I had in mind was that uh, with the uh, evolution of technology, whatever you want to make, uh, the cost is... Uh, going down. You started with software, computer, and then came the bio, and then, then came the hardware. Uh, all were such that cost was uh, going down. Uh, so in the past, you had to have a lot of capital, or you had to be a big company to create something. And uh, in terms of creativity, we are consumers, and then uh, there are big uh, manufacturing companies. But when things become cheaper and less expensive, uh, then uh, people themselves become creators. Uh, creativity um, we talk about uh, makers uh, uh, in uh, English. What we wanted to say was te technological uh, development, including, inclusive of uh, bio, uh, is uh, coming, becoming closer to the general citizens. Uh, and uh, to tie this in with other sessions, citizens and artists, um, what they were unable to do in the past in terms of uh, creation uh, is now possible. And then... Uh, you don't have to spend much money. And there was the example of uh, Thailand. Uh, um, there was an example of art given uh, where you don't have need uh, to have much resources, and then great art is emerges out of that. And there was a talk about uh, Paris. Uh, uh, Gerard talked about breaking the rules, and it's OK to break rules. And uh, the importance of giving freedom to everyone. Simon, talked about uh, the uh, punk, uh, um, uh, Ms. Simmons talked about the punk, and uh, Nanjo-san uh, talked about uh, the uh, anti-establishment type of people. Maybe he collected the anti-establishment type of people, but in cities other than uh, uh, Tokyo, uh, there are these uh, outliers uh, that uh, are the tops of culture. But uh, those who support creativity, in, uh, or the cities uh, should uh, show uh, its support for creativity, even uh, breaking the rules. Uh, uh, with uh, evolution, uh, this uh, technology and so forth, uh, with the evolution, this has been enabled. And I referred to this earlier on. Last year, um, I talked about the top-down uh, city building and bottom-up city building. Uh, that was a question uh, we asked last year. And uh, tying in with this question, the bottom-up capability is increasing. It's becoming stronger. And in our panel discussion, uh, Dickey talked about, uh, Mr. Dickey talked about bio uh, becoming uh, a street thing. And then uh, Mr. Bunny Huang talked about uh, activities centered around Chen Chen. But he uh, made a presentation using the computer he made. Anyone can uh, create something. You don't have to stay a consumer. Uh, he, he talked about the USB uh, cable, a 17-meter USB cable. If you wanted it, you could have it. And you could use that to create anything you wanted. Hardware, bio, you could create anything uh, by yourself. Uh, that's uh, the change we're seeing. Kevin Slavin uh, talked about uh, the net, uh, internet uh, world and the real world. Uh, we, we talked about the analog person and the digital person, uh, games and uh, through artwork, uh, how to connect uh, with uh, the real world and how the artwork connects with the real world. Uh, that emerged uh, through uh, his uh, presentation. And uh, that's another layer emerging in the cities. IT in the past, uh, uh, had uh, brought together the society uh, which was a part in the future. Um, it's uh, now permeating all over the city. 
So what this uh, feeds into is the following. The creativity tool is now uh, available to us. And now, with this change, uh, citizens must be educated on creativity through education and uh, the, the rules of the country must be enabling, must be empowering. And Gerard talked about the Ms. Uh, Gerard talked about the diversity, and there was an applause to evaluate uh, and treasure diversity, or whether you think this uh, as uh, something of a disturbance. Uh, Gerard said uh, it's not good when things are too uh, rigid and uh, too organized. The Japanese, uh, I think there are many who felt that the, uh, being organized is better, being neat and organized is better. There are some people who think uh, messy is good. Uh, there are cities, uh, cultures who think uh, messy is good. But then uh, uh, the first uh, 40 years of uh, Shin Shinkansen bullet trains, they measured uh, how much of a delay there was in the first 40 years. I don't know if my memory is correct, but the uh, average uh, was six uh, or seven seconds. It was seven seconds in the 40 years of operation of the bullet trains. Uh, um, uh, there was only a seven second uh, delay. Uh, that's the kind of society we are. And Paris is the kind of a society that says it's okay to be late. And so basically, uh, there may be a difference between the two. So toward uh, the Olympic Games, uh, what we have to think about on the part of Japan is that we talked about Hong Kong earlier on, and uh, diversity in uh, the uh, questionnaire, uh, diversity uh, was a big thing. But uh, uh, the Japanese culture, is it uh, tolerant of diversity? Can we create a culture that's tolerant of diversity? Or Olympic Games are such that lots of people from all over the world uh, come. And so to this, uh, we have to have a robust uh, uh, country. We have to create a robust Japan. And so. Uh, for that purpose, artists uh, uh, are capable of uh, expressing and uh, they are capable of understanding. When we n n listen to artists speak in Japan, um, they are the outliers. So uh, uh, Mr. Nanjo talk, often talks about the future of art museums. Uh, within the art museums, you can do something special. Uh, you can uh, put a shining uh, rabbit in a museum. Nobody will be upset. But if it's running around all over the city, I believe uh, many things uh, can happen. Uh, the art museum and uh, the city, the boundary. How do we uh, extend the boundary so that as everybody voted, uh, the real diversity can be accepted uh, wholeheartedly in Japan. That's perhaps a challenge uh, for us. That's my feeling. Thank you. So definition of art museum may be changing and evolving. As you have just uh, mentioned, to create, the tools are becoming affordable and available to everyone. That was quite an impressive point. Enjoy also have been taking a questionnaires, surveys, using this gadget. So can I have the first question? Can you bring up the first question on the screen? In order, the current educational system needs to focus more on what? And overwhelmingly, creativity. The audience also thought that creativity is most important. Then in order to enhance creativity, what should we do? Can you give us your comments? What Mr. Nanjo has pointed out, for art and science, you need creativity to start with. That was the point he made. But depending on educative instruction, there could be science without creativity. You can establish such an education system. You can have a scientist always coming up with the right answer. But then for art, you have art history and so forth. So creativity. In my presentation, I have mentioned the four Ps, project, peers, passion, and play. The current educational system, to come up with the right answer always, and uh, you learn collectively and with passion and play. And as uh, Ms. Simons and Mr. Giral, if I try to involve them, a more anti-establishment, creativity is to always uh, to be skeptical of the establishment. and. That is creative. People who are awarded Nobel Prize, uh, if you always follow the authority, you can never come up uh, with anything innovative. So in that sense, one element of creativity is something anti-establishment. 
I myself, for just one year, went to a Japanese school. In art class, everyone would draw the flower exactly the same way. If you're different in just one minor point, then you're told you're wrong. So you are being learning craft and not an art. So how to teach creativity is very difficult. Of course, you, we understand that uh, creativity is very valuable and important, but educational system, that is challenging and problematic. So the answer will not be schools. Outside of the schools like games or art, those are the, the places where you have to learn. I'm sorry, I may have misunderstood, but education is the theme, right? Yes. Well, George san uh, when he delivered his keynote address, well, uh, gave us a lot of good food for thought. But the most impressive for me was that you talked about MIT students, that they use these small uh, artifacts to check uh, their activities of the brain. And when they do that, when the well, when they're active, the brain is active. And when they're sleeping, uh, they're watching dreams, so the brain is moving. But there are times, especially when the students are sitting in on lectures at university, that their uh, brain is not uh, moving. So I told that uh, to our education minister, Mr. Shimomura, and he, you know, I think uh, was trying to contemplate the issue. So he may inquire with you. Uh, okay, I'll send him some data later. Okay, please do that. So we've seen several keywords. We've come up with several keywords. Now we have an expert on cities, Mr. Ichikawa, who moderated a very uh, critical session. So I'd like Mr. Ichikawa to talk about a summary wrap up and his impressions of that uh, session. Also, the uh, Mori uh, Center Art Foundation, uh, Urban City Center, has actually been ranking cities uh, under the Global Power City Index in the 2014 version uh, was announced yesterday and I think it hit the media uh, quite uh, widely yesterday and so we would like uh, you to know about the content of this uh, announcement so Mr. Ichikawa if you could uh, wrap up your session plus talk about the Global Power City Index or GPCI yes thank you well the Innovative City Forum uh, the theme is to look forward into what life would be in 20 years' time. But uh, during the uh, urban development session, uh, we set our sights on 2025 and what would happen to global cities in that year, 2025, when two years, that's 10 years down the line. Uh, 10 years is uh, foreseeable because if you think a little bit, you'll be able to foresee what may happen and it will also link us to the next 20 years. So it could be a turning point. And uh, last year, we talked about Asia cities, uh, which were developing very rapidly, and at uh, this uh, city forum, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Seoul were chosen. But this year, because the uh, Japan will be the host for the Olympics, uh, we chose the top four, uh, the major top cities of the world. So New York, London, Paris, these th representatives of these three cities, uh, plus uh, Tokyo, uh, were actually invited. Uh, we took up these uh, four cities, and from each of these cities, uh, we were able to, of course, uh, welcome uh, the leading experts in their fields. So let me briefly report to you about the discussion that ensued. And what I thought was, of course, these four cities are different, but the the thinking of the people who are involved in city development in these cities are very different too. So it was very, very stimulating. So first about London, Mr. Uh, Peter Bishop, uh, Professor Bishop spoke about London. And Professor uh, Bishop is involved in the major projects of London, for example, the East End Canary Wharf development and the current development of King's Cross. Uh, so he's involved in all of these major projects. So he's one of the key persons in London, and uh, because uh, we are hosting the Tokyo Olympics, uh, we asked him about London, and he said that during the 2012 London Olympics, that the Olympic Park was to be built in the most dilapidated part of the city, and uh, New York, of course, that was the reason why London was chosen above and beyond uh, New York and Paris, and uh, the building which was built had to be rebuilt and also reused through redevelopment. And uh, East London's Royal Dock and the 
this will lead to development, of course, of the Thames River, the coastal areas of the Thames River. And he said that everything went very well and quite seamlessly. Also, in the middle of the city, and this is like Shiodome or Akihabara in Tokyo, they have the King's Cross, which was redeveloped. And he said that there were three aims to the King's Cross development project. One is that to cherish existing things. Second is to cherish possibilities. And third is to think about what's missing, what's lacking. And uh, in the end, uh, they decided to utilize what they can and to set standards about uh, the heights and use human scale uh, for development. Uh, so although this was, of course, taken for granted, it's a wonderful project. And London is changing uh, dramatically. After they hosted the Olympics in 2020, uh, they've overtaken New York to become the top uh, city in the world. And this year, London has again exceeded the other cities by a wider margin. Uh, so I learned uh, the planning behind this that uh, made this possible. As for New York, from Columbia University, we had uh, Mr. Vichyan Chakrabarti and uh, Mr. Chakrabarti. also runs his own design house called Shop, which is the most um, popular in New York. And he's a key person, one of the key persons to discuss uh, the future of uh, New York. And what he said at the outset was that cities will continue to grow and it'll uh, become even uh, more dense and more complex. He said that technology uh, will be amplifying these three developments. Uh, Mr. Ito, maybe you may take issue with this. Uh, so from an architecture, architect's point of view, he proposed how we can counter these trends. And in, in a nutshell, he said that because cities are snowballing, becoming too large, as density increases, uh, you, you can no longer place faces on cities. And so what, how can architecture resolve this issue? And what he said was a more inclusive and beautiful in terms of style, design, also uh, efforts to develop or create cultural spaces using these kinds of uh, criteria would be important. He also said that architects have a feeling that they're Superman, that uh, they can take the lead and do everything. But he's saying that that's changed or that should change. He said that collaboration is important and behind that collaboration would be cooperation uh, amongst people of different disciplines and that this will lead to new growth, he said. That was his conclusion. And he talked about the waterfront developments in New York as well as the Williamsburg uh, you know, factory plant sites. Uh, vacated factory plant sites, uh, which are redeveloped. Also in uh, Brooklyn's Barclays Center, design, which is only possible through computers, are used to develop stadiums uh, and uh, creating a space where people can uh, have, uh, you know, feel excitement through sports or through music. And third is Paris. Dominic, uh, Mr. Dominique Perrault who teaches in Switzerland, but he's also an architect representing France. And um, he had a very unique proposition, and that is development tends to grow large, but uh, there's a variety of people living in that area. Uh, the population is diverse, and uh, Mr. Perrault is a member of the advisory board of the Grand Paris uh, project, and uh, he talked about how to develop or how to create a future for Paris going forward. And uh, the point is to correct the inequities between regions and to explore the possibilities for social and environmental um, possibilities, uh, sorry, sorry, sustainability. And the point is that uh, there's a variety of different people. There are sick people, there are young people, uh, there are uh, people who are divorced, living alone. So how can you capture all of them in city development was his question. And his final proposal was the Hotel Metropole it, to build buildings where all of these people can reside. And of course, this will lead to the uh, city development of all of Paris. 
Uh, so what would be that inclusive building? I think we should first of all think about mobility. But it's not just mobility. He talked about immobility, that there are moments of immobility. So you have to think about these uh, counter forces when you think about the development of cities. And uh, my impression was that uh, when you go to a different city, they have different ways of thinking. However, in the end, I think it all boils down to how to create a large space like city and um, people are of course vexed over the same problems but I, I felt that there was a convergence of energy in that sense so I talked about what's happening to Tokyo and uh, I uh, proposed three analytical uh, criteria and one is the global power city index and second is the inner city ranking global inner city ranking and the third is to look at the metropolitan area Global Metropolitan Area Index, which looks at the metropolitan area. Uh, so small scale, medium scale, large scale. Uh, we should analyze cities using these three scales. Uh, because in Tokyo, we have a population of 35 million. It's the biggest uh, metropolitan area in the world. New York is 22 million. Uh, London is 16 million. In Paris, it's about 12 million. Uh, so they're all different scale. Tokyo is has uh, three times the population of Paris. So I think that uh, the essence would be the same, would be common. However, the shape of the metropolitan area would be different. That's why I use these three scales. And um, so we looked for commonalities despite the difference in scale. And it was also elucidating that we were able to learn what these cities were thinking about. So I was really happy that I chose this topic and uh, invited these people. Well, it's a personal impression, but uh, I had an impression that this will lead us to future discussions. And as uh, Takenaka-san said yesterday, we had a press conference about uh, this year's GPCI. So let me briefly outline the GPCI index for you, this year's version. And uh, let me show you the graphics. Uh, GPCI uh, started in 2008 and currently probably this is number one index to look at the in comprehensive power of a city because others are uh, focused on uh, financial centers or economic centers. So I think uh, when you think about comprehensive power of a city, this is the best index. And this uh, GPCI has uh, six functions starting from economy all the way to accessibility. So it looks at the six functions of a city. Also, it looks at five actors starting with the manager down to the residents. Uh, so uh, all of these five actors will look at the city from the viewpoint of these six functions. And that's, I think, one of the characteristics of this GPCI. And the result is, uh, at the top, you see the ranking, I think. At the top right, London is first, uh, New York is second, Paris is third, and Tokyo ranked fourth. This is These are the top four. And the, there's a, a difference between the top four and uh, Singapore, which is fifth. And of course, Singapore and Seoul are coming up, but uh, there's uh, a long way for them to reach the level of Tokyo. As for Tokyo, Tokyo is approaching Paris. It's almost on par with Paris this year. And in 2012, uh, London uh, held the Olympics and overtook New York. So we have five and a half hour, uh, years. We believe that in the next five or half years, probably Tokyo's ranking will change going forward. And this is this year's ranking. Now, uh, there's something new that we started last year, that is to look at the city's power by looking at the not only just the physical settings, because that'll be enough, not enough. We looked at the operation of the city, the management of the city, and how people feel by the existence of the city, if they feel secure, or if they f feel comfort living in the city, etc. Uh, so from last year, uh, we adopted a new index called the Power to Appeal to Human Senses. And uh, this is called the Urban Intangible Value, UIV. And this year, the UIV index of course, the full-fledged version will be announced at the end of the year, but uh, we did uh, create a uh, interim uh, ranking with the UIV included, and uh, there are six elements or indexes, for example, efficiency or safety and uh, speed as well as accuracy and 
hospitality, which I think Japan can boast of toward the world, also efficiency, a challenging growth. So these are the six uh, indexes. And this year, last year, of uh, apparently 11 of these indexes were included into the GPCI and called the GPCI plus, uh, according to the announcement yesterday. And this is the result. So what's happening is that uh, already uh, Tokyo and Paris, I said, were on par. But if you use this new GPCI plus index, uh, Tokyo overtakes Paris and becomes third. And uh, also the uh, Northern European as well as US cities, which tend to be ranked lower, will go up in the ranking, and also Chinese cities will fall. So the four cities, of course, these four cities are working very hard when we talk about how to evaluate these four cities. I think we have to also incorporate the perspective of the power to appeal to human senses. And these are strengths that Tokyo has. So uh, I think that it's very important to incorporate these kinds of factors into our appeals. Thank you very much for very broad ranging uh, presentation. Now, Tokyo uh, has been designated to be uh, the, the National Strategic Zone, and we had the Advisory Council for that. And I have reported to Prime Minister Abe as to what uh, he has just described. And he, everyone was quite interested. We have the, the growth strategy being put forward, and there are key performance indicators included uh, with uh, the deadlines for different indicators, uh, one of which is this GPCI ranking for Tokyo to be elevated to the third the rank. And that is included in the growth strategy of the government of Japan. As Professor Ichikawa has said, so perhaps we can already say that Jap Tokyo may become the third, but then uh, we here are trying to catch up, but London and New York are far ahead of us. And what about uh, Singapore and Seoul? They are rapidly trying to catch up. So there are positive and negative elements for Tokyo. So there are things that I would like to ask Professor Ichikawa to comment on. At the opening session, can I have the fourth question that I have already asked the audience to vote on? Can I have the fourth question, question number four? In 2025, which of the following cities do you think will be the most prosperous? So London is number one, uh, but then it is 42 percent, and the New York uh, seems to be uh, held a high uh, in high esteem, 42 percent. And Tokyo is doing so-so. So Tokyo may be able to utilize the, the national strategic zones to try our best, but uh, to what extent? we can gain in the ranking. That seems to be the impression of the audience, but what about you, Professor Ichikawa? I know about the present time London, so I was surprised with this result. For many years, New York was at the very top, but looking at the past decade, situation in New York is changing, and on the other hand, for London, they have uh, enhanced in terms of maturity. So the result of this questionnaire survey, if you, I'm not really sure whether people have actually visited London or New York, or are they looking or observing from the outside? I was quite skeptical. I was quite doubtful of these results. And as we are getting older, there could be a generational difference. Younger people may like New York, but when you get older, you may prefer London. Now, uh, Ms. Saskia Sassen from Columbia University, professor in our committee, and uh, she is living in London in New York uh, half of the time. And I told her that I like London better than New York these days, and she said the same for me. So there could be some generational gap. Now, when we took uh, the questionnaire survey for age. I believe two-thirds of the audience were in their 20s and 30s. 
less than 49 years old. So for next year, without going into personal data, I hope that we will be able to take votes based upon age category. Now, I'm sure as you have listened to the comments by the panelists, you may have your own view. So, but before that, now we also have panelists, speakers in the audience. So I have already asked in advance the key word from everyone. In the interest of time, I don't think I will be able to introduce all of them and sorry for that, but let me look at some of the noteworthy keywords. Mr. Nanjo has said biotechnology here of uh, uh, Mr. Venza Christ. Mr. Venza Christ, are you there? Are you here? So if you could uh, care to give us comments. So let me make some additional comments. If I may supplement, uh, Joey has also talked much about biotechnology. So in what uh, sense uh, did you choose this as a uh, key word, uh, Mr. Bio Benza, uh, Mr. Christ, Mr. Benza Christ? Because uh, in our institution, uh, one of the, our focus is about the biotechnology and uh, we believe that as far as we still eat something, as far as we still drink something, that uh, we cannot avoid or we cannot uh, not aware about the biotechnology things because um, for our uh, perspective of view that uh, in the real war now in this planet is about biotechnology uh, because we are not uh, believe anymore about um, imagined about future in the physical things that something uh, we only can see physically or related with the culture or art itself. Because uh, in biotechnology is related also with uh, microbiology and nanotechnology. And also um, nowadays uh, we are in the three step of the um, activities in the global biotechnology. In the first is in the medicine, in the second uh, in the agriculture, and in the third term of um, processing, uh, food processing. So we are uh, really believe that uh, related with all activities, related with all the imagination, uh, how to imagine upon the future, I think uh, biotechnology is, will be uh, one of the biggest um, keyword or issues uh, behind the, uh, all that we talking about for this symposium. Thanks. Hi, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nanjo. Mr. Uh, Joy, do you have any comments? Uh, Mr. Nanjo first, then. I understood that you very clearly uh, think uh, along the lines that you explained, and it's uh, very related to what Joey had to say. Uh, maybe Mr. Christ, uh, maybe you didn't uh, hear uh, the presentation by Mr. Christ. Uh, uh, he works in uh, Jogjakarta, and uh, uh, the kind of artworks that he produces uh, uh, is related to the maker movement uh, he creates on the ground. Uh, it's not only uh, artwork. Uh, uh, he, he uses uh, 3D and digital printers, and what he creates is uh, can be likened to uh, plants uh, flourishing and thriving and growing and and it's uh, very much connected to biotechnology that's the kind of thing he creates i'll uh, concede uh, i'll uh, give uh, joey the floor i'm looking at this list uh, so any others uh, who have uh, said uh, biotechnology there's no one else that has said bi biotechnology 10 years ago uh, only pharmaceutical, major pharmaceutical companies were interested in biotechnology. Now those on the ground uh, are talking about biotechnology, and so there's a big shift there. And uh, those at the top perhaps are not able to see, and those on the ground, the young people on the ground, uh, can see this better. And uh, I think this is very interesting. So once again, I would like to reiterate what somebody else was saying, the metabolism. Uh, the metabolism based architecture was a big movement 
as a manifesto back in the 1960s that cities are metabolizing like the living organisms. There were several art architects coming up with the, the such a vision, and that may be once again very important. From yesterday, I was uh, trying to think of a word to try to, uh, to to give a name to that. Do you have any proposal? So this will be your homework to come up with the appropriate name, the appropriate word. So that would be that would become a very important uh, trend going forward. So Joy, you mentioned uh, the word by Kevin Slavin, interdependence. So Mr. Kevin Slavin, do you have any comments to make? Uh, yeah. I, um, I when asked for the word, uh, I suggested interdependence. And I think in that um, a lot of the technologies of the last, say, 10 or 20 years, whether it's uh, mobile phones or uh, high-speed internet at home, have been uh, all about um, producing a, a romance and a reality around the idea of becoming increasingly independent, of, of, uh, of the whole world being able to be something that you can carry in your pocket. Uh, and all your friends can be connected to you. And I think that the, the reality, uh, of course, is, is that uh, we're all interdependent in, um, in, in very real ways and at various different scales. And so in the ways that cities are absolutely dependent on other cities, that something like uh, Ebola doesn't belong to a specific place, uh, belongs to humans uh, to solve. Uh, in the ways that uh, we relate to each other uh, within cities uh, and, and understanding that uh, they're built out of uh, our collective activity as opposed to individual activities. But also, actually, to bring it back to what we were just talking about, the idea that um, our relationship to nature uh, and our relationship to biology isn't necessarily um, uh, just along the lines of uh, going uh, on vacation or going to the park, but you know, in fact, uh, is a is a far more uh, invisible and profound relationship to to biology uh, that lives uh, inside us and around us in ways that we're only beginning to really understand and discover and to be able to to engage through uh, through technology. And so, uh, I think this these these overall shifts in technology that allow us to bring that to the front and to make that sense of interdependence more powerful are really what the next 10 years or so look like. Hey, Joy, uh, Joy, please. I think this is an interesting topic. And this is a word that I use often. In the United States, uh, you say uh, interdependence. And depending on the person, or rather in the United States, uh, basically, um, uh, there's a negative image uh, of the word inter interdependence. Uh, being independent uh, is uh, something to take pride in. Interdependence is really uh, relying on people, uh, a structure where people are depending on others. And uh, you, uh, some people are treated, given a therapeutic uh, treatment for that. In Japan, um, uh, this is taken for granted uh, that you're interdependent. And uh, we uh, create committees uh, based on that. So creativity or anti-establishment, I don't know about that, but when you talk about the interdependence aspect of the Japanese culture is such that uh, we are advanced, uh, whether uh, in the positive sense or the negative sense, we're advanced uh, interdependent society. Thank you. Uh, a sociologist uh, said, in Japan, people say ningen, and in the Chinese character for this uh, uh, is a person and uh, in between. Uh, people uh, are not independent, uh, and there's uh, this in between, um, which is important. And there are lots of words uh, uh, with the word uh, uh, space in between, and uh, so uh, uh, and if there's a lot of uh, spaces in between, you s and if there's uh, the space in between is wrong, that's an error. So uh, we use that concept a lot. Uh, Mr. Ichikawa, you talked about London. And is uh, Mr. S uh, Ms. Simons here? Is Ms. Uh, Justin Simons here? Justin Simons, uh, is she here? You talked about chaos on uh, dreaming. Could you comment on this chaos on dreaming? Yes. My, my, um, um, I chose those words because they related to my speech. Um, and uh, my own belief is that I think in cities uh, we often try to over-control 
um, and over plan and I think it's important to have the courage to take risks in cities. Um, sometimes the unexpected is good um, and we don't want all cities to look the same. Um, so I think some chaos is important, um, allowing artists and young people to make the city their own um, because great things flow from this. Um, and I said dreaming because I think we always need to create the space to imagine the impossible. Um, dreams move us forward as cities and as societies. Um, energy and resources always follow the best ideas, I think. Thank you very much. So, uh, Professor Ishikawa, can I have your comments? Yes, we are always looking for dreams and aspiring for dreams, but then there is a conundrum of uh, the dichotomy between uh, the dream and reality. Then in creating cities, there are economics involved. So how can we try able to strike a balance and who, which wins? Of course, there could be all sorts of different circumstances. So speaking in general, those of uh, us involved in architecture or urban planning, in the the people who have the final say. It depends on the country, but in case of Japan, like the people in the economics, like Professor Takenaka, you have a lot of say. You have a lot of power. That is my impression. But then us planners and designers and architects, to what extent we can have our own voice? And of course, there are uh, the circumstances of the time. If this is thought to be something essential to the humankind, uh, to what extent we can convince and persuade the others, then the urban planners, the architects, how can we be able to sell the benefits and advantages so that uh, the policy makers can accept that and let's say do it. But then when we had the t London Olympics in 2012 on the East End uh, where it was uh, the more dilapidated and desolate uh, to try to create uh, the Olympic uh, facilities there to try to revamp them. And I believe it will be true for London, but also for Tokyo. What should be the grand design for the Olympic Games is the question I'm asked often. But then we are saying we are not really sure. So to what extent the people would uh, aspire to create something good? And what are the steps to achieve that. Olympic Games would be a good excuse. But if you come up with a good vision, but uh, how to implement them the matters. So it will be a combination. In the economic uh, mechanism, we need to come up with a good answer. Uh, that is my feeling. But ultimately, you should never give up. But I'm sure there are many people who are uh, related to Olympics, but not just giving up, but you need to create something innovative as well. I'm sure the others will say that. That we have a debate in this form is something relevant and important in that sense. Thank you very much. I'd like to hear from all of you, but due to the interest of time, I would like to ask just one person. But before that, on the first day, uh, uh, when we ran the questionnaire, uh, could you Show number two, question number two, which will be more important for future cities? That's the question. 56.3% versus 43.7%. And this is the same as last year's um, survey, which was really surprising. But among the panelists who took the stage, Mr. Randy Pi Bill Pilo, his, uh, her, sorry, uh, keyword is freedom. Uh, Ms. Kurndi Lopato wrote, so if you could comment on this keyword. When I put a keyword of freedom, I didn't mean human rights sort of way, but I mean um, the development technologies, biotech, um, society. And we basically talked about freedom means less rules, less law. People know what to do. We don't have to be confined to the train um, to commute from home to work. We can basically do it at home. We don't have to go to the museum with there's a lot of rules, do not touch, you know, take photos. When the exhibitions and everything out there has been carried out to the public, everybody get involved and participate. 
So the, my word freedom is such a way that we are able to, to live the way they want, the way we want. Um, well, to my answer, it's not contrast with the interdependence, um, in, interdependence earlier at all. It doesn't mean we're not going to be um, at, um, attached to others, but the way we create a society, we're able to create our own rules and, and live the way we want. So this is what, what I see as my keyword. Now, she talked about top down and bottom up in her presentation, whether cities are should be formulated from uh, the opinions which are given bottom up or should the leaders of the city or the manager of the cities control the city top down. And I think that's the context in which she raised the word freedom. And uh, so Christophe Girard, uh, the French word audace, I think this is quite similar to that idea, right? So if you could comment on this, uh, Mr. Girard. Yes. Actually, I like the Japanese word better, daitansa, which is, in uh, my knowledge, even stronger. You know, obsession of security and conservatism are for me the worst poison for the future of our cities. But any act of movement doesn't mean move or progress if there is no talent behind. That's it. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Nanjo, are you satisfied with the answer? Okay. I'm sure there are diverse views and diverse impressions to be shared. So, just two minutes. Can I have uh, the audience to interact with us, questions or comments? Those of you who have questions, you can ask uh, to anybody. So, for throughout the three days sessions, if you have any urgent questions, Anything that you would like to ask or raise as a point, please? Anybody? How about the panelists? How about the panelists and speakers? If you have any questions to ask or any comments to make? Yes, yes, please. Hi, uh, this is uh, Jason. I'm from Taipei. Um, First of all, thank you for the wonderful event. Uh, this is a question addressed to all three um, panelists on stage. Um, I'd like to take uh, cities, um, the content of the discussion of cities and technology, arts and culture to the perspective of, of government. Uh, I'd like to know your comments on going forward, um, how do we design a more open, collaborative government structure? And could the design of the future cities be associated with the decision makers in the government top level who are more open and who are more embracing? And when we move forward, as infrastructure gets better, as technology gets better, as robots um, creating replacements for human beings, but what about people on top? Um, a decision-making power. How do we create a resilience network for them so they, the decision they make are in part, on par with what's going on outside? And I wonder what's your take on this one going forward, especially in terms of design future cities. Thank you. Well, I think we talked about the role of the public and the private sector uh, at the outset. So I think uh, you, uh, you know, elaborated on this question. Uh, your keyword was open collaboration, collision of ideas, I think. Uh, that was a keyword raised by Mr. Jason Tzu. So we'd like to ask the three commentators to speak on this topic. Uh, well, uh, of course, you raised the issue of the role of the government. So Mr. Ichikawa, could you start off? Well, the answer, well, uh, at the outset, I would like to start by saying that this is very, very challenging and difficult. The Innovative City Forum, you know, well, last night, the Japanese uh, Association of Architects actually invited me to be a speaker, and their architects and all city planners are the only members of that forum. And what I said at that 
forum is, I said, well, what you are advocating are your comments being reflected in actual city planning in Japan or in uh, policy making in Japan? And Japanese architecture uh, city planners, you know, they had raised some complaints with me. They said that uh, they felt that their comments, their advice was not being implemented. It's because um, the government, from the viewpoint of the government and the decision makers, uh, they don't consider architecture and city planning very much. Of course, there's a need for collaboration between the two, but if you ask me if they're collaborating well, well, I think my answer would be that uh, from the viewpoint of the planners or the, from the uh, viewpoint of those who propose planning, that uh, there's not much collaboration. Why is that? What's the reason? That's difficult to say. And it depends on the country, I think. You, you, you have a Taiwan formula, for example, or you have, may have a U.S. formula. You know, they're all different. And in the case of Japan, you may know, but we call our country a bureaucratic nation. That is, ever since the modernization, it's the government has led uh, the nation-building effort. So the government does continue to play a very big role in all aspects of life. And they have an idea of what great and wonderful cities are, or well, the same thing for architects as well. And they have this fixed value about what they consider great cities. And that's very esoteric because we don't know. And there's so many people whose views we don't know. So it's the decision makers, the government, who makes the decisions in the end. So is there really collaboration? I think that's always been a challenge. And recently, there's been increased public involvement or residence involvement. It used to be called public participation. Now the word has been replaced by public involvement. Of course, we seek the advice of the public, but in the end, it'll be uh, the uh, people with authority who can make the decisions, and they make the decisions at the end, and that does not include city planners. So that's a challenge. What can we do? We know what has to be done. We know the answer. But how can we actually create concrete steps to enable more involvement. I think there are many difficult hurdles that have to be crossed before we reach that goal. Now, for art and technology, I think we have the issue, similar issue of government uh, involvement, <laughs> engagement. So if you could comment. Well, about, about two years ago, Dem Klofas, who is an architect, uh, wrote a book called Project Japan. And uh, as was mentioned, he talked about the 60s the metabolism architecture in the 60s. And uh, why did he take interest in the Japanese architecture movement of the 60s? And I asked him this directly. He said, architects don't know who to work with. Should they work with city planners who develop cities? Because they don't know who the decision makers are, he said. He also said that uh, this was a business-driven process. In the age of metabolism, we had very, very capable bureaucrats in Japan who created a grand vision for the future, and architects could work with these people. So it was an era when you could share dreams with these uh, bureaucrats. But he said that era ended with the era of metabolism. Uh, so. Although this is not an answer to your question, you know, the policymakers, uh, 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 can they become the partners for collaboration? Do we have such people who can collaborate with us? And there was, I think, a, a second question. Uh, the question is, who has a major impact in community building? Uh, were you involved in this, Mr. Ito, or was it Mr. Ichikawa? Who, who are the most important influencers on the designing of cities? And uh, business was the most frequently cited answer, businesses. Uh, this was a surprise for me. The fact that businesses are thought to be the most important influencers in designing cities, and that's a common opinion. So with that, I'd like to refer to Mr. Ito. 
Now, from the point of view of uh, ICT, if I may make some comments. It used to be that uh, there was media, media was thought to be one of the important pillars of democracy to try to uh, convey information to the public, and then the public will vote, and the politicians would form the government. This is civics in English. What is happening right now is the mass media, and including the social media, and people's voice are co-mingled together. So in the past, it was just mass media, but people have their own voice. And in the past, uh, they would read the information uh, being transmitted from the media, but they were not able to be involved in the whole national debate. But they would look at the information given by the media, and uh, the only means of interaction was voting in the election. But right now, you can have the whole debate with all the people, like uh, the demonstration ongoing in Hong Kong to make it peaceful. You can have a high level of debate with all sorts of people involved. And the voting is not uh, just a very crude means of interface. In Media Lab, we call this the public sphere. The function of the media to try to inform the public and to send information to the public, and the public uh, would respond through voting in the past, but now they are able to react instantly. And the legislation could be integrated and unified, just like uh, direct democracy in the uh, ancient Greek, like uh, the, uh, what happened in Agora uh, in uh, the Greece, but in the public sphere. The democracy in the past and the media and democracy is now being integrated, and there are all sorts of experiments ongoing in the world. And what uh, becomes clear is in the smaller cities, it is quite successful. And in small states like in the Nordic countries, they are quite successful. My theory is that five million, the maybe uh, the threshold. If it becomes bigger, it may be difficult because the, there will be more distance between politicians and people and because it will become too complex. If it is too complicated, you cannot come to consensus. But at the layer of the cities, there are all sorts of experiments ongoing in the United States and also in China. The relationship uh, between citizens and government are sour. They had a very good successful experiment. And through the ICT, the NPOs, non-profiting organizations, they are becoming increasingly active. For instance, uh, there was the United Nations Treaty in banning uh, the, uh, the mines uh, for, for the humans. And because there was an internet, uh, the convention was made possible because it was quite uh, inexpensive in trying to, uh, to come up with the proposals uh, for or the, uh, the convention. So the people have more voice compared to the past. I often visit uh, the Middle East. It is becoming highly complicated. So the state versus state. And what can United States do? It is too complicated. I don't think United States can do anything. So what is positive is that the people are now being involved in the debate and decision making. But on the other hand, it's becoming highly complicated. So you have cities, but at the level of states, how to think about it? Maybe you're starting from a wrong starting point, a mistaken starting point. And for the role of a government, if it is 5 million or more population, what may be the role of state and role of government? That would be a very challenging issue going forward. Thank you very much. From the viewpoint of an economist, this is an interesting issue. In the world, per capita GDP or high income countries would be Luxembourg at the top, and then the Nordic countries. and. 
uh, the Georgistan. Uh, you know, these are all uh, countries with populations of about 5 million or, or about that. And uh, countries with the large populations tend to have a lower uh, per capita income or GDP and are difficult to develop. So the key word would be multi-stakeholder. We are now in an age of multi-stakeholders. And how can we facilitate collaboration between the multi-stakeholders and the decision making uh, as a result of collaboration amongst the multi-stakeholders would be the key going forward. Just for reference, uh, I talked about the national strategic uh, special regions. And uh, there is a, a regional uh, conference which will set up as a decision-making uh, organ. Uh, this is the first time uh, for Japan. Uh, that is, we have the minister in charge of the special district plus uh, the uh, mayor as well as the local uh, government representative. That three layers of uh, representative representation will each have one vote to create a, a mini independent government to make decisions for the region. So this is a new experiment for a new collaboration. And uh, of course, uh, it's having its uh, difficulties in the birth pains. But it may be a small experiment, but I think it uh, should grow into a very major benefits. Now, we're running out of time. But um, to close with, because we have this, I would like you to answer a question. You have the remote control. Uh, uh, there are three options that you can choose from. Amongst the topics raised today, I think if there were to be one topic or keyword, I think inclusiveness, whether we can do things inclusively or inclusiveness would be the keyword. Because economic growth will be inclusive growth. Whether we can create an inclusive society rather than an exclusive society would be the key. For example, Joyce Sang talked about 3D printers, which is a very interesting uh, example. We were given a tool to increase our creativity, and you can, uh, through social networks, have dialogue directly with many, many people. So we have the tools, but when you look at the world, uh, the income gap is increasing. Also, uh, the, there's an income disparity among cities widening, so it's no longer inclusive. So uh, the future that we will live in, do you think can become an inclusive world? If you think yes, number one, please touch two. If you say no, if you don't know, three. So would uh, can we accelerate or become an inclusive world? One is yes, two is no. If you don't know, three. So please push the button, one, two, or three. Is, has everyone voted? Oh, so, oh, this is uh, very good. So you think that the world would move uh, in the direct good direction, that is, to become more inclusive? 94, the more than half, no and don't know. It's about the same numbers. So I guess. Uh, Oh, I, we are getting the glimpse of a, a brighter future, I guess, for us. So what do each of you have in mind? I do hope that uh, we can work to have inclusive uh, social development and an inclusive world. So we will continue with our endeavors next year. Uh, so I'd like to give one or two minutes to the panelists at the end to discuss your keywords based on the questionnaire results. So, Mr. Ichikawa, well, I think you have raised many keywords. But as you consider cities, well, for many, many years, cities used to be physical, hard goods. So you had to create good hardware. But the point is how well the space that you created, the hardware, is utilized and what people feel as a result of using that hardware. And I think that it'll be meaningless unless you take these factors into consideration. I said that uh, earlier, but um, when we use cities to live in a particular space, do we feel satisfied as a result? You have to incorporate that into uh, the um, assessment of 
of uh, city, and that's why we included the urban intangible values. And this is the power to appeal to human senses, but we understand this, but we thought this may not be understandable outside, so we use the word intangible. The key word for me would be intangible. Uh, to create cities based on these intangible values criteria. Uh, of course, I think uh, you should advocate these things. You have to put things into words for them to be realized. And so my key word would be intangible values, which is a little different, I think, from other people. Uh, let me explain this because we have some time. When you look at the city ranking, Global Power City Index, you know, when you try to compare cities of the world, you have to have data to be able to compare, but you only can compare on cities that you have data on, which means that it does not become comprehensive. Uh, so we do rank the Global Power City Index, you know, despite these deficiencies. But on top of that, you have to incorporate the power to appeal to human senses, or UIV. So maturity, I think, level of maturity would be a key word, especially in, in Japan. And I think perhaps the human senses or intangible values could be the key word to illustrate this. Uh, and the second point is uh, from the perspective of Tokyo or Japan, I think uh, I personally feel that we're not communicating enough stories to the world. I am invited to speak all over the world because people don't know about Tokyo. Uh, they want to know more about Tokyo, but uh, they don't have enough information. So when I go to an international conference, I'm invited again to another. So I'm always thinking about how to communicate the good things about Tokyo. If the people know that Tokyo is good, then they'll come back. So we have a mission to perform how to inform the international community about the benefits of uh, Tokyo. Once they come to Tokyo, then uh, they will be able to appreciate the good parts about Tokyo and they'll come back. And they'll go back and spread the word about how good Tokyo is. And that should lead to new change for the future. So the Innovative City Forum, which began yesterday, uh, sorry, last year, I think, um, is a revolutionary symposium. I think it's one of its, uh, the first of its kind. And uh, last year and this year, we were able to invite uh, top leaders of major cities of the world. And uh, they will come to Tokyo and learn and go back with that information. Mr. Bishop from London came for the first time to Tokyo. That's a surprise. But he's walked all around Tokyo and he's uh, amazed and go back, goes back with that amazement. So that's very important. So we need to be constantly communicating, uh, sending signals to the world. And uh, uh, this is a personal issue, but uh, there's a conference called MIPIM, and this fall, the MIPIM conference was held in Cannes, and I delivered a keynote address. Uh, if you could show it, well, next year, this uh, conference will be coming to Tokyo for the first time. MIPIM is a strange uh, name, it's French, and uh, in May of next year, this will be held in Tokyo. So. Well, development is not destroying old things. It's about creating new things. So as we create new things, we would like to also uh, cooperate and communicate messages. Uh, the uh, land, uh, Ministry of Land, uh, Transport, and Infrastructure are, of course, involved in MIPIMS, and this will be a good op opportunity to have people about learn about Tokyo. So I do hope that uh, you will go home uh, with the capability to be able to communicate the good things, the benefits of Tokyo. I may have misunderstood you. I may have misunderstood. I thought that we were supposed to end at 5 o'clock, but uh, we were given longer time, I think. Always we are running out of time, but uh, this was a happy misunderstanding. So what the Professor Ichikawa was saying about the intangible values, the sensibilities and sensitivities of the people that uh, the Mori Memorial Foundation Institute for Urban Strategies will be making public announcement towards the end of the year. So he has explained the salient points. I'm sorry, I was, that was my uh, mistake. So amongst the panelists and speakers who have not yet given opportunity to speak uh, about uh, the keywords, so can I ask them one by one to explain about your keyword? So perhaps starting from here, can I ask uh, the speakers and panelists? So please. So Marco, perhaps? I, I think my keyword is change. Um, but in, in my mind, I, I, when I 
wrote this is about our anxiety to control change. And I was thinking about the necessity to change towards sustainability. Um, I think exactly we are here because we are anxious about the changes that will happen to, to the world, to our cities, to Tokyo. And the second anxiety is about the question whether we can or cannot change. Uh, the other aspect about change that I was thinking when I wrote this is uh, the speed of change, the intensification of change that is, I think, becoming higher and higher. And I think the talk about art, about innovation, is about also how to cope with this change. Do we have time? Also art, do art have time to capture the essence of time and to reflect upon it? because the chains are so quick. And I think that's also uh, my point when I said earlier that art also need to change itself, not just to offer ways to change. Thank you. Thank you. On change, uh, um, Mr. Ito said that uh, we're changing faster than according to Moore's law. So the speed of change Going forward, do you think there'll be a further acceleration? Most probably, change uh, will become uh, more intense. We talked about uh, control earlier, and this uh, is related to that. If you try to control everything, change or uh, complexity uh, becomes very difficult. But uh, to a certain degree, within the environment, if you are there just uh, in a very natural way, um, it's not strange. For example, if you go to Chinatown or a market for the first time, uh, you're very confused. Everyone becomes confused. But if people are used to going to Chinatown, um, they're used to the chaos and they can still uh, get the in important information out of the chaos, and they can go to find good food in good restaurants. Chaos uh, is such that our brains are capable of uh, dealing with uh, complex uh, situations and chaos. I forgot whose slide it was. Uh, there was uh, a slide on planning, planning versus uh, creativity. So if you try to plan something, um, change is very difficult to bring about, but uh, in the Buddhist uh, way, if you uh, feel your presence in the now and you know what's going on, and with a certain amount of uh, confidence, if you can uh, respond uh, naturally, even if change uh, becomes infinitely uh, intense, unless you go against the tide, uh, there's no uh, problem. What you have to be mindful of, and uh, in my presentation I uh, talked about this a little bit, uh, going forward uh, in developing technology and uh, developing various things uh, to be as natural as possible, to go along with the natural flow, uh, to think about things uh, along with the trends of nature. Uh, and so you'll be uh, naturally following uh, the natural speed of uh, complexity and so forth. It's a difficult uh, subject, but Um, you have to uh, approach this with a sense of humility, and uh, it's the same with the government. The government has to uh, trust the public, and if the government uh, has a sense of humility, then uh, the general public will embrace that. In the past, um, the government was more controlling, so uh, maybe the word controlling uh, should be dispensed with. It may be difficult, but if you uh, dispense with that word, you can cope with change. Hey, Thank you for your comment. So can I ask the speaker, panelist, please? I will repeat what I said, that to dare, innovative and to dare are actually the same world and the same feeling. So like in Japanese, when you say daitan na a dare decision, I think it's absolutely to do with this forum. That's why I chose these words, I think. They are exactly the opposite of being afraid of fear and a heavily, I would say, uh, protected society, I think, which is a danger. So 
This forum has been an extraordinary example of this. Thank you very much. There are other speakers and panelists who have not spoken yet. So those of you who have not spoken yet, the panelists, speakers, perhaps uh, the Rick Strait Matter Tram. So if you could please identify yourself and uh, speak about your keyword, please. Jun, I'm the, an artist from Vietnam. My keyword was ecology, which deals with systems and relations. Um, I think the reason why I put that there was I'm very interested in paying attention to the very smallest components um, and not to neglect um, considering those important. And some are very real and some are sort of imagined. I remember in uh, Doichi's uh, slide presentation, he had BI for before internet. He had a very f funny image there with humans coexisting with dinosaurs. So I thought that was um, this fictitious ecologies, um, but still important. Thanks. Comment. Any comments? Uh, Mr. Gunara, please. Uh, my uh, keyword was uh, urban mediations. So uh, I. As I said earlier, I, I, I don't think that the, um, it's very easy to think that the city is everything that you see around you, and it's very immediate. You know, there's no nothing between you and the and the city, but uh, nothing is like that. Uh, everything is mediated, and um, uh, sometimes by tools that we have at our disposal, like technologies, but very often by us and how we think and how we navigate and how we manage our social relationships. So um, that's how I, I, I came up with urban mediations. Uh, Tetsuya Mizuguchi speaking, and I chose the word uh, engagement. Um, the subject of metabolism came up, I believe. I am engaged in uh, media design. At uh, Keio University, I teach uh, media design. Uh, transmedia is a word which appears often. It's a new concept uh, in the past. Multimedia, cross-media, uh, we used to use these words. Transmedia is a new word that's emerging. Seamless media design is uh, becoming necessary including uh, contents. And uh, what this is, uh, what uh, Joy often says, uh, it's uh, a the AI thing after internet. After internet, uh, media design must uh, transcend the boundaries. And uh, there's fusion and merger, and uh, this uh, complex uh, thing uh, which is hard to grasp. How do you creatively design that? And how do you uh, uh, build that uh, as an architect? Uh, I've been hearing to the discussion taking place, and I believe that uh, metabolism in the world of architecture, the AI wave has already hit uh, the uh, industry, the architectural industry. So uh, what is very physical uh, in the cities uh, cities uh, used to be made of physical material. And what does the after internet uh, bring about? And what changes uh, will it bring about? And I think we're talking about the changes which are occurring. So how do we engage? And uh, we will probably change the definition of who the city belongs to. We have to redefine uh, the people who live in the cities uh, or the administration, the government. And then uh, those who uh, do business uh, in the cities, and they are visitors and tourists, and they will probably become uh, will be probably become part of the city. In uh, designing uh, engagement, I think uh, that is where uh, creativity, the new creativity, uh, comes into play. And then uh, people, everyone, has human wants; they have different motivations. And so when people come to Tokyo, they have certain expectations. And when people become uh, come to like Tokyo, um, something probably uh, happened that uh, made them hap uh, that pleased them. And uh, or they might find a place, uh, a place where they can uh, uh, realize themselves. And people who come and the cities, uh, how do we uh, 
bring about engagement. And I think that is uh, what creativity will about in the future. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. So please. Saito Huda from Rhizomatics. Now, I chose the word protocol. What Mr. Mizuguchi has said about engagement, in order to realize engagement, protocol something necessary between city and art or between city and nature. If you are to have communication on the same format, you need a protocol, a certain rules, so to speak. There are all sorts of diverse things are being created by rules and protocol, for instance, smart grid, uh, what we try to, to build. Minor things will become obstacles, and the laws and regulations, legislations, are not well developed yet for the technologies to develop, for example. So you need a protocol to be well developed. And art and city, the relationship between art and nature, or city and nature, and uh, with the others. If we can become more natural and freer, that would be made possible with the protocol. And I have some hacking power, so I should try to hack and try to play with the relationship between city and nature, for example. Keyword was um, art creativity, <coughs> two keywords. Um, for me, actually, um, the mind setting is very important. <coughs> There's a great philosopher, um, and he was saying, Wittgenstein, he was saying, everything of what you can think of can exist. And that's a great sentence, actually, and I think this is something what is a request not only to the so-called decisions makers or um, I think this is a request on, on all of us to go basically to the borders where we use our imagination or we can call it dreams or talent, whatever, um, where basically where, where we use our setting and uh, change our minds that way that we can be open, collaborative, that we can talk, start talking to each other, as well that we start developing a language to talk to each other because we have the terrible situation that we have a highly specialized society, everybody is specialist, but <clears throat> we're missing the language in between the specialists. So I think the in the moment we change the mind, we change the mind setting that we can go ima imagine things what we might not imagine in the moment if we uh, basically try to fight the enemy of self-control. That, I think, would already put us in a better place and would basically eliminate that terrible world of decision makers because if you think of the word decision makers, there are obviously as well people who have no decisions to make. And I think this is more scary. So this would be <coughs> my word. <laughs> Thank you. I believe for all the panelists have been covered. Have we exhausted uh, the panelists? In any case, all the keywords have uh, many broader a meaning, and I believe they have given good food for thought. And uh, if I can suddenly designate you as a related event for the Innovative City Forum from World Economic Forum in Davos, a session was held uh, yesterday. And the moderator for that session, Ms. Ishikura, Professor Ishikura, can I have your comments, please? Yes, so this is Ishikura. Just uh, the morning at yesterday uh, at the breakfast meeting, we had the, the uh, Davos, WEF at the meeting. There were about 60 or so people participating, including the business leaders, parliamentarians, and the academics. 
And what、uh, we have done is Vision for Tomorrow Japan is the project that, that the World Economic Forum is promoting. And what can communicate from Japan? To, what can we send out as a message from Japan? So, Japan looked from the world and what needs to be done immediately. Those were the key topics. So, let me explain. Japan is said to be superb and Tokyo is wonderful. Those things are just words. So, what we need to do is what we, are, we have experienced and what we are trying to do as a vision, maybe we could、uh, present these. The messages, and we would like to know about failures as lessons to learn. And if you can have success stories, we can also learn from those examples. So, we would like to look at、uh, the both sides for different issues like、uh, aging society, healthy living, and information and digital, and the competitiveness and education. So, there are several issues, the often discussed about issues. And as lessons to be learned, and as success stories, what can we learn as well? So, based upon the knowledge being accumulated, what can we send out as a message from Japan? This is something we have discussed in the session. It was quite an exciting and interesting and very positive discussion. People often say that the Japan is bad in these aspects,、uh, we don't have any message to send out. And there are many things we hear as cliches, but the debate yesterday was quite positive. Now, as I was listening to the comments from the others, there's one thing I would like to mention. Thinking about cities, you're often putting the citizens in the city in the center, or as Mr. Ichikawa was saying, what about the outsiders who are coming into the city? Maybe we need to have the perspective from the outside also included, especially as Joy has said earlier. Not tradition, but anti establishment feeling is missing in this city. But when people come from the outside, it may be. Very stimulating, and Tokyo can change, and Japan can change as well. Those were the things I was thinking about. So, the view from the outside how will they assess Tokyo and Japan? This is something that we need to give priority on. Thank you very much.、Uh, we'd like to bring the discussion back on stage.、Uh, um, Professor Ichikawa gave us a keyword intangible value. That's the keyword he gave us. Uh, Mr. Nanjo and Mr. Ito also uh, perhaps uh, could give us keywords、uh, in view of the discussions,、uh, the total discussions that h a s taken place.、So、what's the keyword、uh, for the future life in cities and lifestyles?、Uh, I uh, raised the word the creativity earlier on, so I'd like to start there.、Uh, that, that is not my keywor-、uh, keyword, however. Uh, Professor Apinan and uh, Mr. Ka- Ms. Uh, Kandi uh, uh, presented uh, the flood in、uh, Thailand and how the general public、uh, came up with、uh, different ideas to deal with the flood、uh, situation. And、uh, these scenes were presented. Uh, uh, so、uh, when I saw this, I felt that creativity was very broad indeed.、Uh, you.、Uh, Try to exert your creativeness、uh, within the environment、uh, that you find yourself in. On the other hand, you have、uh, biotechnology and a very advanced uh, uh, technology. Uh, there is a creativity in science and then、uh, art. Uh, uh, you have advanced forms of uh, art uh, uh, where very sophisticated technology is used. So, all of these、uh, require creativity and、uh, on education as well. I'm a, if you teach art history just as a art history,、uh, it's boring and the know how is、uh, dormant. It's not leveraged.、Uh, there are ways you can teach. You uh, teach uh, about why、uh, these th- certain things were created and uh, what uh, one would do if one were in the creator's shoes. When you think about these things, uh, uh, education becomes. Uh, 
stimulative and creative. And so creativity is very broad indeed. So, and I feel this is very important. Unless you strengthen this aspect that uh, there is no future for Japan, that is what I think, and that uh, there's no future for mankind. And so therefore, uh, rather than talking about uh, Japan alone, we have to think about uh, the entire mankind and uh, think of approaches uh, that are required. Creativity, I think, would be a key word in this respect. But uh, I think uh, there is uh, something uh, further ahead and uh, that's beauty, uh, that's aesthetics. Uh, it's perhaps uh, strange that I mention it now. Um, uh, this person is uh, not here. Uh, Mr. Vishan Chakravati uh, said beauty. Um, uh, when you build cities, uh, for him, uh, perhaps uh, that is the standard. That is what I thought. For science, beauty is uh, very necessary. For example, you have a well-made uh, formula, equation. Uh, that is very beautiful. And the DNA structure is very beautiful. So uh, what is uh, very essential uh, is uh, very beautiful. You look at uh, artwork uh, or pictures and say it's beautiful. It's something different. Uh, it's something more substantial, more essential. Uh, but uh, that's one of the uh, standards for value, uh, which goes uh, beyond uh, creativity. Uh, theoretically, uh, it's difficult to talk about this uh, uh, any further. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very appropriate uh, of a director of an art museum, uh, creativity and uh, beauty. Uh, Joy, please. I'd like to talk about uh, the inclusive uh, statistics. Uh, I think it was very courageous uh, to do that exercise. And uh, if I did it, uh, the result would be that it's not very in in uh, inclusive and uh, the entire uh, atmosphere would become very uh, dismal. So I, it was very courageous as this was done. Uh, and this is uh, related to the diversity uh, topic. If we leave things as it, it's, it's uh, very difficult. Everybody is expecting uh, something. And uh, recently, uh, I read a book called Anti-Fragile. Uh, the writer uh, um, does not have a very good uh, character, uh, so I don't want to sell that too much. But uh, what uh, this anti-fragile means, uh, fragile means it's uh, um, subject to a break. It's uh, very weak. Uh, there are mm, uh, certain things in society which are fragile. The economy is fragile. And uh, people say the opposite of that is robile, but it's different. Uh, fragile is minus, uh, robust is zero. For the better or for worse, uh, the stress uh, does not change. Anti-fragile is, uh, according to the author's uh, hypothesis, for stress and uh, stimulus, the more st the stimulus, the more the stress, the thing becomes stronger. And as uh, Gerard has mentioned, uh, if you have impurities, uh, the organization becomes uh, stronger. Um, well, the example that I like uh, the best uh, is the immune system. Uh, when uh, bad bacteria comes in and it's bombarded with a bad bacteria, you become strong. If uh, children are subject to this, they don't be become strong. So it's very important for a, a city or town to become strong. Uh, there are lots of people. Uh, there are people who are stressful, and, uh, mm, and the people who absorb stress uh, mm, become stronger. And then there are who, who those who succumb to stress, um, and that's related to the change. And anti-fragile societies, anti-fragile art or anti-fragile uh, towns and cities, I think uh, that would be very important uh, in the future. Without this, uh, you can't have something that's inclusive. Uh, there are impurities in Japan. Um, uh, it takes time for us to uh, absorb and incorporate in impurities, uh, so we need, we need to work on that. Thank you. Anti-fragile is a very impressive word. Thank you. Leaders must be people who are able to incorporate uh, things which are different into their organizations. So, well, I would like to make the last comment to sum up the two-day or three-day event. And I think what's very important is that uh, technology, art, and city development, that we were able to gather together experts in these three 
areas, but we were able to very comprehensively synthesize the results of their discussions uh, through this uh, conference. And what I felt strongly is that uh, we are we have very strong momentum to take a step forward in the right direction. We have the momentum. So momentum for me would be the key word. Momentum would be, like Joy san said, uh, technological momentum. Or perhaps as we approach the Olympics, uh, we see policy, government, and uh, private sector or business momentum to change uh, Tokyo. And so I think uh, we have to be aware of the fact that momentum is now building up. And that's the characteristic of this era. I think we need to be aware of this. The Olympics, the Paralympics, uh, Mr. Ashimomura, who is uh, the Minister of Education, will be uh, the minister in charge of the Olympics. And I think the Olympics will bring special momentum to Tokyo. Because when you look back, you know, Tokyo, the very basis or foundation of Tokyo as it stands today was formulated 50 years ago when the first Tokyo Olympics was held. So. We can create, use uh, the Olympics as a special momentum to enable things that we f normally would not be able to do. For example, uh, we have a law uh, on the expropriation of uh, land. And of course, there's a law there, but it's uh, very difficult to actually apply the law. But during the Tokyo Olympics, we were able to expropriate a land using that law. And that led to the creation of the se uh, number seven ring road or circular road. And uh, the Olympics, I think, is changing as if it were a living organism. It started uh, during the, it was an event held to accompany uh, the expo. And only nine countries uh, involved in uh, 13 or so different competitions. But uh, because it grew, it became independent as an independent event. But uh, they were not able to gather funds, enough funding, and there was uh, some terrorism. Uh, so there was a situation in 1984, the Los Angeles Olympics, when uh, no one dared uh, to uh, no, hold the Olympics. But the US dared to do that. It was the only country who, who raised its hand. And in the United States, there was strong momentum uh, they were able to incorporate new sponsors. And uh, of course, there's a lot of uh, criticism about the Los Angeles Olympics being a very commercialized Olympics. But uh, after that Olympics, uh, the Olympics built momentum. And now we have so many countries who want to become a candidate, so who want to host the Olympics. So it's a building of momentum. And now uh, this is similar to uh, uh, Mr. Joy's expertise in IT. During the Little Hamel Olympics, some microsystems, which is now uh, acquired by Oracle, I think, uh, experimented with a site to collect information on just Olympics. And they were able to have many, many visitors. And uh, that led to the increase of the server technology or the development of the server technology. And young people who, there were a group of young people in California who wanted to engage in such technologies. And uh, of course, uh, people who were willing to fund them. And that led to the development of Yahoo. And uh, of course, uh, during the Tokyo Olympics, because there will be many important people coming, uh, there were uh, two people who started up a security guard uh, company just two years before the Tokyo Olympics. And now that has grown to SECOM, which is a big company. But it's a company that started with just two people. Now they are have grown into a 530,000 uh, strong uh, business. Uh, uh, so. I think that we are now at a stage uh, where there's a buildup of momentum to create transformations and change. So I do hope that uh, we can add our uh, strength uh, to this momentum to create uh, new things in the years to come. So Tranamon Hills is, I think, a representative example of this. It's, uh, I think, a representation of this new movement. And I'm very glad that we were able to hold this symposium at the Tranamon Hills. Last but not least, I'd like to thank all of you in the audience, as well as the panelists, plus the Mori building and all other uh, people who were so uh, instrumental in making this a success. So thank you very much for your participation and your cooperation. Thank you, Mr. Takenaka, Ito, Ichikawa, and Nanjo. Uh, could we send them off with a hearty applause?